Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. Um, and, and before we get started, I, I just wanted to thank um, the Future of Diplomacy Project, and in particular, um, Erica uh, Manusulis for hosting us uh, this afternoon. Um, it's an honor. It's an honor to be here, especially with um, the, our esteemed panelists this afternoon to talk about um, Latin America and sort of the, the geopolitical influences um, of, of today's uh, geopolitical ties. And very quickly, what I'll do is just introduce our esteemed colleagues, even though um, they need no introduction. Uh, and um, we will get started. I'll ask a few questions, and then we'll open it up to, to the audience for questions. Uh, to my right, we have Ambassador uh, Paula Dobryansky. Um, she is a foreign policy expert, a uh, former diplomat specializing in national security affairs, Currently a senior fellow in the Future of Diplomacy Project here at the Belfer Center um, and the vice chair of the Scowcroft Center for Strategy and Security um, at the Atlantic Council. Um, she, uh, just numerous uh, events, but I will just call out that uh, the ambassador served as the undersecretary for state for global affairs from 2001 to 2009, um, which among her primary accomplishments was the establishment of the US India, US China, and US Brazil Global Issues Fora, which truly advanced um, crucial work in, in our international cooperation um, on environment, energy, health, um, development, and humanitarian issues. Um, and in 2007, she was the, the president's envoy to, to Northern Ireland, which was a key moment in history. Um, and to her right, we have Ambassador McKinley, um, who, very, very short, I promise. Um, uh, he uh, served as the US ambassador to Peru, Colombia, Afghanistan, and Brazil. Um, and his final posting was senior advisor to the Secretary of State um, before uh, joining um, as a senior counselor to, to the Cohen Group. I was to keep it short. Um, and to his right, we have um, former Foreign Minister of Panama, um, Erica Munez. Um, she currently is a fellow here at Harvard. Um, uh, and um, she was... Uh, uh, the minister who, who focused on the vice minister of multilateral affairs and cooperation and was the chief of staff of the Ministry of Trade and Industry um, and truly instrumental in negotiating the U.S.-Panama um, free trade agreement um, and as well as uh, taking the program back to the portfolio. Um, and with that, um, I again want to thank all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, I'm thrilled uh, to be talking about um, Latin America and sort of where we are, because truly for the first time ever, uh, left of center presidents are at the helm of major economies, including Brazil, Mexico, Colombia, Argentina, Chile, and Peru. COVID-19 pandemic really played an important role in this shift. Um, as the population suffered greatly, economic growth um, was stifled. Um, rising unemployment, soaring inflation, and obviously it just added to the stark inequality that was already present in the region. The citizens elected leaders in most cases did not represent the status quo, um, whose platforms really focused on social investment, um, and increased access to health care and, and education. Um, and, and we'll see, we'll see what happens. Um, there's very little right now in, in terms of the substance of how that will be funded and, and kind of the vision, but it will, it'll be interesting to see. And so with that, I actually wanted to open it up to our, our esteemed colleagues and, and ask, you know, the Western hemisphere has, has also felt sort of this real impact from the changing tides of geopolitics. Um, and before we really begin unpacking this, um, I wanted to each uh, ask uh, each of them, if they can tell us, what their top three issues are that they're tracking for shifting geopolitics in the Western Hemisphere. Ambassador Dobryansky, I'd like to begin with you, if I may. Good morning, everyone. And we'd like to welcome a former ambassador here uh, today. Uh, glad you could be with us. Um, and others who are here, we're just delighted. And we're looking forward to a very active uh, session. I think I'm going to take my comments uh, broad. Um, we're living in an era of great power competition where the United States, China, and Russia 
are definitely uh, in competition with, uh, with, uh, with one another. And what's the issue? The issue is that both China and Russia are very much united in a common goal and objective. And that is to uh, uh, influence uh, or diminish, should I say, diminish the influence of the United States globally. And at the same time, to also seek to fragment our alliance relationships and partnerships. So that is one of the, I'd say, core defining frameworks that definitely is playing out on the, uh, in, in and throughout, not just Latin America, but also globally. And it plays out in different sectors, if you, if you will. And let me add one other point. And the other point is, it's interesting for me to note, in the last administration, when they issued their national security strategy, it was in fact defined by great power competition, citing United States, China, Russia, and then at the same time mentioning how then there are other countries that align themselves with China, with Russia. It varies, but from Iran, to Venezuela, to Cuba, Nicaragua. I mentioned those because of the discussion about the region. So in that context, um, uh, it was cited. Now, let me go to the second part. This administration, same thing. It cites that there is great power competition foot that defines the geopolitical arena, but it also advocates for uh, cooperation and looking for areas of cooperation. And the example that they give not in Latin America, but in another part of the world, but it transfers over, is actually the Pacific Island states. It talks about in, the, in their report how um, uh, China has engaged extensively these Pacific Island states. Well, it's the same. You especially have China uh, investing throughout uh, Latin America. They argue that it's important for the United States to engage in the Pacific Island states. I'd also transfer over the same concept in terms of our engagement with Latin America. And the point to close on is that the area that they picked out as one example for Pacific Island states is climate change, which has been a priority of the Biden administration. Why adaptation matters to islands, not just mitigation, but adaptation and what measures you could take to forestall climate change. So in the case, I'll just pick it out, in the case of Latin America, there are a number of issues that I could pick on that really matter. One that I happen to work on, which actually does matter, and that's, by the way, an issue of clean access to water. Um, it's only one issue. There are many that one could cite. But simply put, instead of identifying exactly three, I'm going to give a broader framework, which to me you transpose, it really defines our geopolitical uh, scene at this time and impacting Latin America. Thank you, I appreciate that. And Madam Foreign Minister, over to you. Thank you. Um, I, I think it's important when we're talking about the geopolitics of our side of the world and, and understanding how that plays out globally, um, that there are trends, as, as, as Ambassador was mentioning, that impact what's happening here, right? The US-China, what's happening, Russia-Ukraine, more generally sort of the slowdown in the economic downturn that we are all suffering. But what does that mean specifically for this region? I think one, most, and I'll focus specifically on Latin America and the Caribbean, you have countries trying to figure out if they have to pick or not a side. So you have the potential non-alignment, and I'm not talking non-alignment as the movement that we had, you know, the Cold War in the 60s, 70s, but non-alignment kind of, do I need to say I align with China, I align with the US, or in the case of the Russia, Ukraine, and you've seen a couple of countries did not condemn the invasion of, of Ukraine. There were some, there are three at least that are trying to play a mediator, but not really take a position. So you have some countries trying to figure out, do I maintain myself non-aligned or the other side that I'm seeing that it's the multi-alignment. I side with this country because it benefits me or this is the relationship that I wanna create, but that doesn't preclude me from siding from another, with another country on some issues. 
I think that's something that is interesting that we have to understand it and rather than condemn or have sort of like a moral filter on it, please at least first study what's happening, which is a different movement than what we had say 40 years ago. The second one, we have sort of a constant trend of the globalization or this hyper globalization that we live is not delivering what we thought it would deliver. So you have a lot of countries looking inwards rather than outwards. Um, it could be a style of leadership. It could be sort of um, the expectation of what trade was going to bring to the countries that did not end up happening. But ultimately, it is a trend that we ought to understand, analyze it, and see where we're going with this. And finally, I think that it's very relevant on our side of the world, the irregular migration and how that is changing each of our countries, the, move, the, the amount of my irregular migration that we're having now, as opposed to say 40 years ago or 20 years ago, has exponentially increased. And that is changing the landscape of several countries, um, the way that the US also perceives Latin America and particularly in the border, whether it's seen as a problem rather than an opportunity, whether it's creating different issues, for instance, in Mexico or further south, so I think that's the third trend that we're seeing much more exacerbated now and that we ought to understand as, as sort of a new movement that, that, that needs to be tackled and dealt with. God, I have many, many questions to, to unpack as we go through this. Ambassador McKinley, over to you. So thank you and a pleasure to be with you. And uh, I'm going to build on the comments uh, <laughs> Ambassador Dubrowski and Foreign Minister Munoz have already made. If I can start uh, with a top line here, and there's a tendency to try to view what happens in Latin America as sui generis, or as somehow not part of what's happening more globally. I think that's a mistake. And if we look at the trend lines over the last 10 years, we'll look at the trend lines over the last five years, whether we're talking about populism, shifts in political attitudes, polarization, responses to the pandemic, economic downturns, challenges of climate change, responding to the shift of globalization into regionalization as an approach to uh, cooperation on the political and economic levels. Latin America is uh, definitely manifesting many of the trend lines we're seeing elsewhere in the world. In terms of the three uh, top issues, and it's difficult to narrow them down, and uh, particularly Foreign Minister, I think you hit on them from the region's perspective. But uh, if I can uh, sort of add a couple of nuances and dimensions to what you said, I would say the first priority for the region is actually economic growth, economic transformation, responding to the challenges of a digitalizing uh, world economies, modernization, innovation, uh, the environmental challenges. And uh, every government in the region whether it's in Mexico, whether it's in Argentina, whether it's Brazil, whether it's right of center, left of center, has as a priority trying to address the economic uh, foundations of prosperity, which can allow governments to address uh, the more serious long-term questions of social inequality and tensions that NEGA addressed. The second trend line, I think, is reflective also of global uh, uh, politics, but it's uh, the shift uh, in political, um, let me try not to be diplomatic about this. Uh, there's a lot of questions being raised in the United States about the shift leftwards in Latin America. Uh, I would underscore that the shift leftwards in Latin America in most places is being taken uh, in democratic elections, democratic choices by their populations with institutions in place and working. And uh, I would suggest uh, Brazil uh, would be a place where that is evident in that January 8th in Brazil uh, is not the equivalent of January 6th in the United States. Institutions uh, have held through very tense times in that country, for example. So as we look at the shifts in the political landscape in Latin America, is this part of a cyclical left-right uh, manifestation in Latin America, which we've seen since the end of the Cold War, or is something more significant underway? And uh, also, again, given the points 
mega made a reflection of a democratic deficit, which I would argue we see uh, in many other parts of the world as well that needs to be addressed. So that's definitely a factor uh, as uh, the region uh, confronts the coming year or two. And the third point, uh, which has already been mentioned, is the relationship of Latin America and the Caribbean uh, with the outside world, how uh, the great power competition or the pressures to take sides on Russia, on China, on Ukraine, uh, define how the region uh, engages. And I would suggest that what we're seeing now is uh, Latin America, and I love the way you put it, multi-alignment, is uh, making a decision not to take sides. And by the way, neither is Sub-Saharan Africa, neither is the Middle East, neither is South Asia, neither is most of Southeast Asia, neither is Central Asia. Uh, this is not uh, something that should uh, be of uh, utmost concern to us. The question is whether as they watch developments, try to maintain relations with us, with Russia, with China, uh, respond to what is happening in Ukraine and elsewhere, uh, whether we can find commonalities where we can still work together uh, on certain questions. And the uh, context for that is U.S. policy towards Latin America, which uh, was defined by the Biden administration, Summit of the Americas, many changes from what we saw during the Trump administration. But the bottom line is American uh, official views of Latin America continue to be governed by two to three issues, which are not germane or central to how much Latin America sees itself, whether it's a focus on Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua to the expense of the rest of the continent, whether it's a focus on we have to have migration accords and agreements on the border with Mexico, and that subsumes other uh, uh, concerns we have, and uh, our concern with China and uh, our perception that it's taking over in the region, which it's not, um, and how uh, we respond to how Latin American governments are uh, trying to manage uh, the relationship uh, with China as well as Russia. We'll stop there. Thank you for that. Well, that actually is a great segue as we try to pick up a little bit more um, and understand uh, Russia's invasion um, in, in, of Ukraine and what that means for Latin America. Um, and the impacts. Obviously, last month marked um, uh, the, the one-year anniversary of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We should really begin by acknowledging um, the terrible human toll this conflict has had. We have over 12 plus million uh, Ukraine refugees who've lost their homes. They've had to flee their homes. Um, tens and thousands of soldiers and civilians who've lost their lives. Um, and again, cities were completely leveled by Russian uh, missile and artillery barrages. Um, and so this incredible strategy has had an impact geopolitically as well, um, as we see Russia trying to rewrite uh, its own history um, and Putin wanting to reassert his global power. Um, so, you know, putting that into the context of, of where we are and sort of the impacts on, on Ukraine, um, I wanted to turn it over to, to our panelists and our experts um, to try to understand this and understand sort of its impacts on, on Latin America and, and where the Western Hemisphere is, is viewing this. Um, so Ambassador McKinley, um, let me turn it over to you. How have the conflict affected global geopolitical alliances and how have the responses of Latin American leaders shaped the region's relationship? So if I can start uh, with a general point on this, um, there's a tendency uh, to view uh, the crisis, the war, invasion of Ukraine as an existential crisis, not just for the West, but for the world as a whole. I share that view and can spend the next three hours speaking about why that's the case, but I won't. But I think we need to also <clears throat> in pursuing the building of coalitions and common ground acknowledge that most of the rest of the world is not approaching the crisis in quite that fashion. So when we look at Latin America, it's not aligned on Ukraine. I repeat, uh, they're uh, following the path being trodden by many other regions of the world. Coalition against Ukraine numbers 52 or 54 countries. That means there's almost 140 other countries that have not taken a stand on Ukraine in terms of uh, imposing sanctions, 
in terms of breaking diplomatic relations, joining efforts uh, to isolate Russia. The paradox, as Ambassador Dobryansky pointed out, is that in Latin America as elsewhere, many if not most of these countries actually condemn uh, Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, joining uh, uh, resolutions at the United Nations calling for the unconditional withdrawal of Russian troops from Ukraine. But it doesn't follow that in their day-to-day -day relations, they're going to impose sanctions, break trading ties with Russia, or take a more forceful stand, uh, export weapons to Ukraine, as we have asked of certain countries that have surplus uh, equipment from Russia. And many of them have long-standing security relations with Russia, like India, um, who have to think twice and three times about how they handle a delicate relationship. In the case of a place like Brazil, 20 25%, second biggest agricultural producer in the world, uh, they import 20 to 25 or did uh, their fertilizer from Russia, for example. So there's all kinds of undercurrents that work there to define how regions react. In the case of Latin America, um, I would suggest the following. Uh, no one in Latin America other than perhaps Venezuela, Nicaragua, I don't even think Cuba, maybe Cuba, uh, endorse Russia's uh, invasion of Ukraine, but uh, they're going to continue the policy of not imposing <laughs> sanctions. Uh, there are going to be uh, governments, in particular uh, President Lula of Brazil, uh, and to a lesser extent a couple of others, interested in being part of peace efforts and promoting negotiations uh, independently of uh, what the coalition um, against Ukraine does. And so that is going to be a part of the paradox uh, we have to uh, live with. Uh, the other uh, factor at work here, I think, is uh, the geopolitical underlay in terms of economic dynamics. We're seeing the resurrection of the BRICS, the British, Russia, India, uh, China, South Africa, uh, I won't call it an alliance grouping, uh, uh, surfaced in the 2000s and is being revitalized with a focus on establishing uh, development financing banks, uh, efforts by the Chinese to build out broader international coalitions uh, through the Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization Council and so on. And Latin America is sort of judging where and how uh, that will be of benefit to them. So as they respond to uh, Ukraine, I think we can continue to count on, frankly, non-alignment, hopefully not a shift towards Russia uh, or accepting Russia's uh, invasion and still acknowledging what a threat Russia's invasion is to the primary principle of you don't change sovereign boundaries by force. But it's going to be a cautious stance, and I think the United States, uh, like it has to with other parts of the world, uh, manage that uh, approach and see where uh, there's uh, convergences that can assist the broader objectives we have in Ukraine. Thank you for that. And, and building off of that, Ambassador Dobryansky, how do you foresee this conflict evolving, and how will it impact the global economy? <clears throat> Let me say a few words about situation in Ukraine, and then I'd like to also pick up on the first question and say a few words and add on to what Ambassador McKinley referenced. So first, how to define the war in Ukraine. I think most experts at this time would cast it as more and more a type of war of attrition. Massive destruction where virtually uh, uh, every aspect of infrastructure is raised to the ground completely. But it's not just that, it's also massive uh, 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 impact on also the economic functioning of Ukraine and its society, its industry at large. We all know the extent to which the uh, food. Uh, and the exports, particularly of grain, of wheat, been impacted. Uh, countries like Egypt that have relied some 75% on their grain from Ukraine have been completely impacted in this, in this regard. So <coughs> as Ambassador McKinley will want to underscore very clearly, it has had a global impact. No one really is you know, completely immune to the situation. 
And then there's also the third. And the third is, is the actual uh, impact on uh, Ukrainian culture and the very essence of what it means to be Ukrainian. The fact that you have uh, this substantial number of children who have been uh, literally uh, seized and taken to Russia uh, away from their families. Um, uh, uh, and not just that, but I think the number of those who are either refugees out of the country or those internally displaced, it's something like in the range of between, I'd say, 12 to 14 million. It's rather substantial. So I wanted to first start with that. It does define a type of war of attrition. Um, there's the attempt to uh, look at ways or means of negotiation. I honestly don't see that happening in any time in the near future for all the reasons I've just mentioned, because think about it, the Ukrainian side has, will not have leverage unless they win in a negotiation and across the table with the, with the Russians. And the Russians haven't indicated any incentive to negotiate seriously. If I may mention two last pieces on that, the two words of America. It's worth noting that actually because of the, because of the um, uh, situation there, the irony is that actually Ukraine has become much more unified. When you think about those in Kharkiv, in the east of Ukraine, and those in the west, as Ed Luce wrote in the Financial Times, he said, you know, thank you, Mr. Putin, you've unified Ukraine very solidly. So I will submit that. And then also Zelensky himself. Politically, he had challenges prior to this. He has stepped up to the plate. And when you look at polls for Zelensky and his own leadership, he has risen up in the polls, and Ukrainians are, 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 are proud of his leadership and his forthrightness. Let me say a few words, if I may. I'm taking a little bit longer space because I wanted to take the moment on just defining Ukraine a bit more. But let me say a few words about Latin America. I'd start with this. I think that it's fair to say that Latin America is not monolithic. I think that Latin America has also chosen to be as was defined by both uh, Ambassador McKinley and Mr. Munez. Um, here, I think that it's fair to say, though, that it doesn't mean that Latin America is disengaged. And that's where I think it is interesting to note the point about their vote and their recent voting in this UN resolution. The UN resolution condemned uh, uh, Russia for invading Ukraine and called upon Russia to get out of Ukraine. Interestingly enough, all of the Latin American countries, and Caribbean, I don't have the figures on that, but I was focusing on Latin America, but on, in this sense, South America and Central America. Um, in this context, all of them actually voted in favor, very interesting, including Brazil, which was a contrast to earlier when uh, Lula made the comment that Ukraine is to blame just as much as, as, as Russia is for what's happening uh, two years ago. But here, uh, there were three abstentions, uh, El Salvador, Bolivia, and Cuba. Nicaragua was the only country that uh, voted no. Interestingly enough, I couldn't find Venezuela. Venezuela may, maybe just didn't show. <laughs> I don't know. I, uh, it wasn't recorded. But I just mentioned this to conclude with this. You, you mentioned, both of you, the term you know, of, of non-alignment. I like the term that was used by a Bloomberg journalist, or it was in Bloomberg, Eduardo Porter, who wrote in Bloomberg, um, that it's optionality. And I think it is. I think that the countries are positioning themselves based on their trade relationship. Their actual, you know, some have closer relationships with China. I think of Brazil. You mentioned the issue of fertilizer with Russia. I think of soybean with, with China, which is a substantial uh, part of their relationship. Um, Latin America, South America, Central America has limited impact. I mentioned Egypt. Not that many countries have this direct in energy consequence or trade consequence out of this. 
So that also has some impact. And finally, I would just say that I think, you know, you're going to see that each of them are positioning themselves depending on how they see their relationships with these great powers, uh, uh, whether it's the United States, you know, and kind of, well, this is what we think, <laughs> you know, uh, we're not taking your position, or this is what we think of Russia, China, and the impact. But why is optionality a good word? Because to give a final example is Mexico. Uh, 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 Lopez Obrador came out and he condemned the actual giving of the leopard tanks. On the other hand, in Chile, uh, you know, uh, here, uh, the Gabriel uh, Boric uh, uh, came out and he uh, actually condemned Russia. So I wanted to take it down just a little bit of a level that I'm not suggesting it's not non not non-aligned, that's kind of a double negative, but, but I think that their positioning, the countries are positioning themselves based on what they see in their own self-interest. Thank you for giving me a longer space on that. Absolutely, one. thank you for that. Um, and Minister Munez, we wanna hear from you. Um, what are you seeing as the repercussions of the war on, on the Western Hemisphere? I'm going to give the other side, and this is the Latin American side. And on the Latin American side, um, putting aside what's happening for a moment on Ukraine and Russia, the repercussions on the region have been really difficult. Um, you have, we were all coming out of the post pandemic, really, really difficult times for everybody. We were one of the hardest regions, hardest hit regions. We have the highest numbers of death we had, I mean, I could go on and on, and I don't think people talk enough about how bad it was in Latin America. Um, a couple countries closed their schools for two years, you know, for countries in Latin America that were already struggling with education to have the schools completely closed out for two years. Imagine the repercussions for those children that essentially generations lost that they will never be able to catch up, essentially. Um, there's also an uptick in food insecurity uh, for various reasons that are obvious uh, for many of the grains, fertilizers. Um, but generally, I think inflation, other parts of the world have been or have more resources available to themselves. We have, because of the way that the pandemic was managed, most of the countries maxed out their external debt. And you can see, look at the Caribbean, go country by country, really, really tough times because. When you're struggling for resources and you have oil prices surging and you need to pay the electricity bill, governments typically resort to sovereign debt. And if the external debt is maxed out, that leaves you with very little maneuvering power. Um, and that in addition to, as it was mentioned here, that a lot of new presidents with these high expectations from their citizens, because you have this new wave post-pandemic, people were frustrated from the pandemic, new leaders elected, a lot of high expectations, and then little resources to deliver on those high expectations. So I think I celebrate that we're here because I am a huge advocate and I, I celebrate that the center has taken an interest in this, that we don't talk enough about Latin America. Um, I think that we are right now a bit of a lost opportunity because in times of crisis, you form alliances and the true alliances actually come into play. Um, and now that I'm post my government job, I think I'm able to be a little more politically incorrect. I think that the US relationship with Latin America, unfortunately, is very much dictated by local politics. Um, the voters and what certain states uh, that have a majority of Latin vote may or may not say with relation to one or two countries dictates very much their engagement with Latin America. And I think that's very much short-sighted. Um, in this moment where there is huge repercussions in a region that is, as, as it should be, struggling and trying to get out and move on and, 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 and uh, create opportunity and employment for all their citizens, I think we forget the good part, and that is Latin America also represents opportunities, opportunities on a number of things, opportunities on 
resources, opportunities on critical minerals. I mean, we're talking about chips and all that. There's so much resources in Latin America. And I think, unfortunately, the the, the dialogue or, or the narrative tends to be sort of like on one single item. Um, so what is sort of the, the future and how it, will that play out? I think at the moment it's uncertain there was sort of like a hiatus coming you know, after the summit of the Americas and some of the elements as, as Ambassador McKinley pointed out um, and that the region and the expectation is true. The way that the leaders perceive themselves and their value might be different from what other key partners uh, may seem to believe. Um, and I'm hoping that that gets corrected, that, that there is the opportunity that we looked at Latin America as the key partner in the region and the one and the strongest alliance that we can force. And, um, the 50 billion that were mobilized to Ukraine last year were totally merited and deserved it. But if you had only done like 1% of that, 10% of that to Latin America, the amount of growth uh, that could, you know, the concern of migration. I mean, there are so many elements and, and I think that we lose perspective of the value that Latin America could bring not only to the U.S., but more broadly in a global state where we're trying to maintain sort of the, the institutionality, you know, like the democracies as a whole are taking a toll and we have to show that democracies can deliver. Thank you for that, especially, uh, you know, democracy delivering is, is a key message even in today. Um, the Summit for Democracy too um, is being held. And as we speak, actually leaders are, are meeting um, uh, to discuss sort of the, the next step. Um, but sort of shifting gears, uh, because we have another key, key challenge that's happening in the world, and that's the rise of China um, and, and the China-US tensions. Um, so before opening it up to the audience um, for, for question and uh, for Q&A, I just wanted to sort of let us reflect a little bit um, with, with China and, and the China-U.S. tensions. Again, um, just to, to set the stage, you know, uh, where we are. Um, last October, um, as expected, uh, President Xi Jinping was given his rare third term um, at the Communist Party's National Congress. Uh, Xi's administration includes many, many loyalists um, at the very top of their, their leadership positions. Um, and it'll be interesting to see whether these, these allies will be willing to provide them with good advice or, or not, um, but proof will be in the pudding. Um, and after recently moving past their zero COVID policy, uh, Beijing is now very much focused on reviving its economy. Um, and that's not a very easy undertaking. Um, but there's there's moves to increase investment and shore up the country's um, deeply deeply depressed consumer sector, um, and so the road to recovery for Beijing will be quite long. Um, and the balloon incidents of a couple of months ago were yet another tension point um, in U.S.-China relations. Um, as we may recall, Secretary Blinken' um, uh, visit to Beijing was was postponed. Um, and we're not sure when the next meeting will, will take place or when the next visit will take place. He did meet with uh, China's senior diplomat, Wang Yi, on the margins of the Munich Security Conference, although um, that exchange was, was far from productive. Um, and the U.S. government has made public statements um, that there will be consequences if China helps Russia um, evade U.S. sanctions or provide material support uh, for Russia's military. So we see this uh, really as a tipping point um, in the relationship uh, that will also have an impact on Western businesses um, in China, and, and they can be uh, found in, in the crosshairs of, of these tensions. The tensions will likely grow um, as intense competition um, increases in very significant areas, um, and, and I'll flag sort of trade and advanced technology um, as key areas. And so, Foreign Minister uh, Munez, I actually wanted to turn it over to you and um, how you see the U.S.-China tensions impacting other regional powers. Um, and then sort of the second point is, 
how do we see this impacting the Western Hemisphere, especially as the region has become a centerpiece of US-China competition, um, both in terms of issues such as 5G technology, infrastructure development, and access to critical minerals that you just mentioned? Um, so there is, when you think about US-China, it has a different meaning than what it did a while ago. I remember in 2004, I was in government in Panama, and President Lula was at that time president. He went to China, and I remember we all were sort of like, oh my God, what is he doing there? He took like, I don't know, 50 business uh, representatives and went there, and we all, uh, the rest of the region sort of like stood and watched him like take this huge delegation. He came back, trade increased between um, China and Brazil. Now he's in power again. He came to the U.S. three weeks ago. Uh, we thought, I, I am with the Atlantic Council, and we thought that we were going to host him and create sort of like a lot of business partners here in the U.S. for him to meet. He declined that, but he is now, he went on a visit to China, and he took, I think, 200 business representatives to China. So the way that I perceive that in 2004 and that visit from now, because it was a different time and visiting China in 2004 does not mean the same as visiting China post Ukraine, Russia, post this escalation of the US, China conflict. Um, so we all are sort of on tiptoes, I think, on how you manage that relationship. I think that 5G, 5G is a simple example of something that you just learned that these are some of the things that let's not get into something that is complicated and is going to bring you more heat from both sides than what you need. So I think that countries are learning to navigate that conflict, um, some more successful than others, because I think there are some sort of some moves that may play out more outlandish and that may not resonate as well or as easy as it was 15 years ago. Um, and, and trying to unpack this a little bit more because it is quite difficult. Um, Ambassador Ryansky, the US-China, um, they've been engaged in this unprecedented rivalry on technology dominance for, for a while. Recently, the US has been trying to pull allies such as the Netherlands, Japan, South Korea, Germany, and Taiwan into this battle. How do you foresee these conversations playing out and how will this tension impact global order? Well, uh, let me make three broad points. Uh, first, in terms of the very question that you asked, I think it's going to depend. I mean, each of the countries that you've mentioned, they each have very different reactions. Uh, let me just take Japan. Japan, well before Ukraine, actually, and the invasion of Ukraine, Japan was already pulling out its high technology out of China uh, because of security concerns and because of the threat that China itself, in of itself, poses in the Indo-Pacific. So, and they would look for alternative uh, manufacturing uh, areas, including India. Um, <clears throat> in the case of Germany, you know, I, I look at relative to the energy space. I'm going to weave that in, although your question was on technology. You know, most would have said, would uh, Germany have started constructing an LNG terminal, you know, which they are doing now and moving away from Nord Stream 2. So the weaponization of energy has caused them to make some very significant changes and shifts. So the answer really to that question is each country is going to look at how it is impacted directly by the current circumstance and try to establish a kind of independence to the extent that it can. And that's very hard to do because we are interwoven. Um, if I may, can make just two other points. One is I do wanna build upon what you said because I think um, uh, Minister, what you said uh, was important. I happened to be uh, years ago in the George W. Bush administration. And as she was speaking, what I thought of when he was elected president, I don't know how many of you remember, but his first visit was, and he was adamant about it, was to Latin America. Maybe being from Texas, he understands the border, the proximity, 
But I remember that that was very important. Why? It was to designate and show right up front, you're our partners, we're close, we're friends. We should be looking at so many different lanes of building upon the relationship. Tragically, we know what also happened, you know, after I could say just even my own portfolio, things get seized because of what happened with 9-11 and then with Afghanistan and then into Iraq. But I did want to say your broad point is a valid one, but I'm going to take it away from uh, the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Why? For a simple reason. Her argument, in my view, stands on its own. That should have always been the case and should be the case in terms of our policy approach towards Latin America. But on Ukraine, why I care so deeply about what we do now is because if we do nothing, and we're talking about China, and this closes the loop, basically Xi Jinping will say, well, look at what happened there. They got away with it. Putin got away with it. And that's why we put these monies into it so that there's success there. Hopefully success is defined by the Ukrainians, which means all Russian troops off of, the, off of its sovereign territory. But if there isn't success, that's gonna have a lot of ramifications. It will send the wrong signal and not just to Xi Jinping, but to others. So I wanted to make that distinction. She made an important point. Latin America, it does matter. Uh, in this case, in our relationship, and it has to be an important part of our foreign policy, and it hasn't always been, I'll say that, where it's not just words, but there's action to it, which is what you're saying. But separate from that, I wanted to make the point as to why this matters and our investment in it matters. The stakes are very high. Indeed, they are. Um, Ambassador McKinley, China's continued friendship with Russia has caused concern. Um, from the Western business and investment community. So how does this impact investment and trading relations with China? So I think I'm, I'm going to state the obvious because it's been uh, said by the administration in an extraordinarily clear fashion. The decision to move forward by China with support for Russia's war effort in Ukraine will have serious repercussions. And uh, the way it's been said, by whom it's been said, uh, the messaging is consistent. And I would suggest if we do reach that point, um, I would not even hazard to try to project uh, or guess at what the consequences might be, what the impact will be. But uh, I take the warnings uh, very seriously. And so as companies, countries look at trading and investment relations um, more generally and with China, they're very aware of the tensions between the United States and China, the impact it can have on much more than energy markets, uh, where a lot of focus on technology, on chips, semiconductors, on uh, the impact of regionalization, China's outreach, uh, to global markets. Uh, as companies think through what they do, an interesting dynamic is kicking in. What we're seeing is companies that already invested in China are not really leaving. But what they're looking at is diversifying production and supply chains, looking at the potential for disruption to a certain extent, looking at nearshoring. A lot has been written in recent weeks about Mexico beginning to benefit. Uh, from companies rethinking their decisions on providing and supplying the U.S. market to include Chinese companies uh, that provide goods to our uh, market. And so, uh, but for those that are invested, uh, still very much a focus on the potential of the Chinese market and hoping that at some stage tensions uh, begin to ebb between the United States and China and they can continue to do business, but they're alarmed. I repeat that said, it's not just what companies are doing. Uh, 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 Chancellor Schultz visited China in November with a large business delegation. President Macron has a trip planned with a large business delegation this year. Brazil, Foreign Minister, as you mentioned, is uh, visiting at the moment with a large business delegation. 
So as we look at U.S. tensions with China, we really need to place them, as we did earlier with Russia, in a global context. The rest of the world is not rushing to take sides on how the U.S. and China deal with each other. Uh, they're trying to balance and calibrate their own uh, interests in regions and bilaterally as they pursue relations. And I think we're going to see um, this sort of uh, delicate dance um, continue. The truth of the matter for Latin America in terms of impact, there's a lot been written about Latin America coming under Chinese influence. Over 100 countries in the world now have China as their leading trading partner. There's no reason Latin America should be any different. Uh, there are countries where very significant Chinese inward investment is underway. There's no reason why that should be different uh, in Latin America. What has changed in terms of Latin America's relationship with China in the last five to seven years is what we saw initially in the 2000s into the last decade of taking on sovereign debt what seemed like soft loans from China, almost ceased entirely after 2015. There's almost no sovereign debt lending taking place. And that was because of the experiences of countries like Sri Lanka, Zambia, Djibouti. But we can look inside the region, the most prominent example being Ecuador, trying to eliminate $10 billion of loans. Uh, the country clearly uh, regrets having taken on board. Second, as they look at investments, if American companies aren't investing or European companies aren't investing in necessary infrastructure projects, uh, telecommunications upgrades, uh, electricity grids, the Latin American countries aren't welcoming Chinese investment. But they're doing it with open eyes. And we don't see anywhere an interest in replicating the Chinese model of development, of doing business. It's a transactional relationship that is taking place. And so uh, there are the same concerns, as Ambassador Dobrowski mentioned, about 5G telecommunications penetration and efforts uh, to protect uh, key parts of infrastructure. So I would suggest that Latin America's relationship uh, with China is uh, somewhat more complex than headlines uh, would seem to suggest because of their growing commercial ties. And a final point. The United States for six years has been pursuing a very aggressive policy on sanctions, on uh, uh, critical infrastructure uh, investments uh, in regards to China through the Trump administration and through the Biden administration. Last year, US-China trade set a record, notwithstanding the sanctions, something at over 750 billion. 2021, it set a record. What I'm trying to suggest here is not that the issues and concerns that the United States has about China are not real, but that the process of decoupling, the process of rethinking the relations is complex for us, and it's complex for other parts of the world, including Latin America, and everyone is thinking through how they should be managing a relationship which uh, clearly has tensions and difficulties. And in the context of Latin America, what we're seeing, I think, is a more sophisticated approach by governments in the region uh, to sustaining trade and investment relations, but not necessarily uh, falling uh, into uh, uh, in a debt trap or other kind of dependent relationship with China. Thank you for that. And, and being very cognizant of, of the time, I want to make sure we, we open it up for, for questions and answers. Uh, we only have a few minutes left. Please go ahead. Uh, yes, there's a, so sorry, there's a mic right here. Can we move it around? So I'm curious um, what your thoughts are. When we talk about Latin America, we never really do the oh, words. Thank you. My apologies. Thank you. I'm Janice Lentz. I'm a mid-career student at APS and a future PMF, a presidential management fellow. So when we discuss Latin America, I hate this one. When we discuss Latin America, we never mention um, Guyana, Suriname, French Guiana. And I'm wondering, but so it's almost as if they don't exist. I'm wondering what your thoughts are in terms of China. 
global climate change because of Guyana and the Amazon. Also, we never mentioned French um, Guyana and France's influence with the satellites. And I'm curious what your thoughts are on that. Having visited all these countries, I find it quite significant and nobody really discusses uh, France's relations with the satellites with various countries. It's problematic. take a stab at it. Um, and uh, the, uh, I would suggest that it's, uh, you know, not just uh, Suriname and Guyana, French Guyana that don't get talked about, it's Caribbean. Uh, it doesn't get talked about uh, to any great extent uh, when we're talking about the Western Hemisphere. And it's an omission that I think needs to be corrected. Uh, in terms of Guyana, that omission, uh, is being corrected for one very simple reason, the extraordinary uh, discovery of these oil reserves, the oil and gas reserves, which are transforming the country and are becoming part of geopolitical considerations on energy supplies around the world. And so uh, perhaps the moment has come. Uh, I think some of the focus is now also shifting to Suriname on uh, the assumption that there's uh, also potential reserves there. So something is beginning to happen. But your broader point on the importance on focusing on a couple of dozen other countries uh, in the region, I think, uh, is something that needs to be uh, corrected going forward, particularly in relation, as you mentioned, to climate change uh, concerns. I can throw in the regular migration uh, concerns that we have in the re region, uh, how you deal with uh, energy, uh, uh, crises and concerns for that region, which are particularly pronounced. And uh, I'll say this diplomatically, but there are initiatives that are launched in the region. Uh, I look at what the government of Panama, uh, Costa Rica, and the Dominican Republic have offered in terms of building out a uh, trading uh, and investment relationship to promote everything from nearshoring to uh, economic development, uh, social investments, and uh, I, I would suggest that it doesn't receive the attention it should uh, in the United States because we're so focused on these two to three other uh, concerns that we have, and uh, it, it's it's a it's, it's a deficit that really needs to be corrected if we're going to take a strategic hemispheric approach in the context of a world that's increasing increasingly working on the basis of regionalization. I, I'm, I'm going to just jump in very briefly. Is there a wee bit of comment? I can, but I, you can go ahead. If you like. I, I, thank you. I've been to Suriname as an election observer during my time in government. I don't know if this mic is on. It doesn't sound like it. I'll speak up. I went to Suriname during my time in government as an elections observer. And that was the time that Boudicca set its Dutch uh, stepped aside. There have been some political shifts there, good and bad over time, but I will say this, the good news is there are those, it doesn't get the attention, maybe the high level attention, but there has been in the State Department a focus on it. I don't know right now, quite honestly, uh, in terms of Suriname, but I can say during my time that we were a very focused, I did go as an official election observer, and we were trying to work with the new government in trying to move it forward. Guyana, I do wanna mention this one, we had, as part of the Future of Diplomacy project series, a distinguished series, we had the former president of Colombia, Ivan Duque, come here. His focus is Guyana. He mentioned it when he was here. He has an Amazonas initiative, and he's partnering with Guyana, the leader of Guyana, and actually bringing them into the fold and working on the, the whole issue of the protection of tropical forests, etc. I think it's a great initiative, and he's really working to publicize it, to get it attention that it should. And finally, I'll just say this, you, you, I, don't, I don't, you didn't, I think you mentioned the Caribbean. I will say this, it doesn't get a lot of attention, but during my time, which part of my responsibility was environmental issues, I had one of the bureaus was Oceans Environment Science, and actually we did white water, blue water, with the Caribbean, and we also brought in the governor of Hawaii to discuss with all the Caribbean countries, how can you bring in funding and try to develop renewables? 
And that's tough. It's not an easy issue. But I will say there is some good work going on. I know that's been done. Right now, I don't know all the things that are happening right now, but your point is well taken. But I especially wanted to mention Duque because he has personally focused on Guiana. And Guiana with the satellite? That I don't know. Sorry. I don't know. You wanted to touch, otherwise we can open it up. No, but no, no, please go ahead. No, I, I mean, I think that a lot, I, I think that Guyana. Guyana right now is like top of mind for everybody, but see, I have a very skewed view because I'm on the other side and what people here find as relevant or not might be different. Um, Suriname has taken like a lot of leadership within the region as well. Uh, they, they held the presidency for a while within the Caribbean. There is a portion that may escape the outside world and that's that we are not as unified as what we should. And Guyana and Suriname are examples of sort of like this internal odd idiosyncrasy of where we don't find each other as neighbors or as part of the region. And that's something that we've struggled as a region for a long time. And hopefully we're coming across from that. But um, I think that uh, hopefully um, at least uh, Guyana represents to me what I was saying. And that's sort of that I'm hoping that Latin America is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity. I am pretty sure that Guyana is now seen as a huge opportunity. Thank you for that. I know we're very tight on time, so we may take two questions, two or three questions, if that's okay. Hey there, um, my name is Sebastian Borda. I'm a first year MPP student here at the Kennedy School. I have a question for Ambassador McKinley. So my sense from hearing you speak was that you think the United States may have a little bit too high of a threat perception when it comes to Chinese influence in Latin America. But between the commercial ties, you know, we saw President Castro um, cut diplomatic ties with Taiwan. We have the Chinese president now backing Argentina's sovereignty claims in the Falklands. I mean, what sort of consequence do you think this has um, for a potential Taiwan contingency? <clears throat> do you think the conflict in Ukraine um, you know, gives us a sense of what that might look like, both in word or deed, um, or um, am, am I overreading um, those? Um, you're, you're raising a very controversial question. <laughs> and uh, I will uh, uh, be careful how I answer this, but uh, at last count, I think it's somewhere around 180 countries, including the United States, that do not recognize have full diplomatic relations with Taiwan. So the focus on whether Latin American countries, and it's not just Honduras, we're looking at the possibility of Guatemala and Paraguay as well, uh, depending on elections, uh, changing uh, their uh, diplomatic uh, uh, relations uh, from Taiwan uh, to Beijing. Um, this is uh, something which has been a given on a world stage for a very long time. And countries make their own calculations on it. Earlier, I spoke about how Latin America, let's not look at it as uh, a world onto itself. And the corollary is, uh, why are we imposing concerns on uh, Latin America about what they do on the international stage that we don't apply necessarily elsewhere? These are decisions that are made by governments uh, on the basis of their national interests, and it's a trend line. Um, and I think that is distinct from the whole issue of how the United States and China deal with each other on the uh, greater political questions uh, we have on the table uh, between us. On the uh, diplomatic ties, who recognizes what on and I think from Falklands to what happens in Gulf states, et cetera, I would just suggest uh, that uh, global diplomacy is constantly shifting in countries. To go back to the multi-alignment, uh, countries look for uh, alliances and support on the issues that are dear to them in terms of their own national interests. Thank you. Um, hi, my name is Juan Felipe Celia, uh, public policy student here as well uh, from Colombia. Uh, my, my question is about, you know, we were talking about some of the inevitability of Latin America shifting towards China or looking to China for 
uh, deeper economic ties um, and the soft power implications it has, that that involves. Is there any way for the U.S. to somewhat buck that trend in terms of um, maybe increasing aid uh, to the region or changing the composition of the type of aid that it gives to the region um, or any other sort of kind of like economic elements to how they can buck that trend? There's a question directly. Oh, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, yes, I think that there are many. Um, this is the whole, my whole premise is based on um, that there is an opportunity, there is an opportunity for engagement. You can look at a number of uh, 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 metrics to see the lowering of uh, investment from the U.S. in the region. Um, I don't think that necessarily we just need to talk about aid. It would be ideal, but it's not the only way to engage. And I think it's an opportunity that is lost and as a trading partner also has changed. So there are a number of ways where we could see this as an opportunity and engage more the region. Um, not only as a response to China, but more broadly, I mean, the natural neighbor of the U.S. is Latin American and the Caribbean. So to me, just sort of like makes sense. This is your neighborhood. Um, and then the same, by the same token, the problems that are within our neighborhood, and I think of Haiti and what's happening in Haiti and looking elsewhere when there's a terrible situation happening there. It's another example. And, and the reason why I bring it up is because what happens in Haiti affects the entire region. It, it affects our neighbors in the Dominican Republic, but then one of the largest uh, sources of irregular migration is also Haiti. So this is all interconnected and trying to deal with the problems locally um, and engaging in a positive way. Um, most of the countries are relatively small with some exceptions. Um, large infrastructure projects immediately trigger massive move within the economic uh, 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 landscape of any country and creates opportunities and, and generates sort of like this positive engagement towards the U.S. that um, I think it's necessary. And things that are not obvious to us and that are probably problematic, um, not, not, I wouldn't say problem, they're scary and they're happening. It's sort of like, for instance, I, I think of media. RT, which is a Russian um, uh, media company, has enormous uh, ties or, or uh, a network within Latin America. They've been working that for years. It's a way of engagement. They push out whatever content they want and a lot of people end up listening to this. I'm, I'm just giving this as an example, like when you have these strategies, these long-term strategies of getting involved and listening and getting, and, and there are ways to counteract that. You just need to like have this press and make it a goal and try to counteract with positive and, and opportunity seeking and, and show that this alliance delivers and is positive and, and strength, it strengthens democracies. So um, I'm gonna try to keep this short. And, uh, but I grew up in Latin America my entire life and the diplomatic corps has been one of seeing the region uh, put in second place by the United States by successive administrations. It's never been any different. There have been moments where there are opportunities, like NAFTA in the 1990s, the focus in the Bush administration on pushing uh, trade agreements, free trade area for the Americas, but also looking at social investments. And uh, but uh, the truth of the matter is uh, we have a history of not engaging with a region other than through ideological prisms, whether we're looking at it in terms of East-West conflict um, or recently a focus on, you know, what happens in Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua is that that's going to define what happens with uh, democratically elected uh, uh, left of center governments and so on. And, uh, and then you know, now we're concerned with China and Russia penetration and so on. There is a count. I'm going to start with a figure. It wasn't 50 billion. It was 70 plus billion last year for Ukraine. It was 2 billion for the entire Latin American Caribbean region. Nobody's saying we shouldn't be supporting Ukraine. Earlier I said it is the existential conflict of our time. We can do no better than 2 billion for a region 
where we say we have many concerns, not least the regular migration and the impact on the United States. American companies don't invest in Latin America. They invest in East Asia, they invest in Europe, they invest in Mexico and Canada, but more in Canada than Mexico. Um, and uh, so somehow the whole structure of our support for American firms investing overseas, but particularly in Latin America and uh, the Caribbean, uh, needs to be rethought as competitors and strategic competitors, to use the term, from other parts of the world, uh, try to uh, move in uh, to the region. Uh, we don't do much in terms of increasing trade uh, between our countries, especially at a moment when we're focused on critical minerals, when we're focused on alternative uh, production uh, requirements, on everything from food to semiconductors. Uh, we don't take advantage of initiatives, as I mentioned, like Panama, Dominican Republic, Costa Rica, to open up and look at what this might look like as a more dynamic relationship that benefits uh, all sides. Uh, we don't replenish international development banks, whether it's the Inter-American Development Bank, the World Bank, with their focus on investments uh, in the region. Um, and uh, so uh, I would suggest the opportunities are legion for a different approach to Latin America. I repeat, the Summit of the Americas lay out many of these points at the policy level and lay out a, a, a strategy for engagement. What we need to see is the practical impact of resources and much more sustained engagement. And just so you don't think I'm speaking in fanciful terms, that's what we do with India. That's what we do to some extent uh, in Gulf states. It is possible to make a decision that regions are important enough to engage with and expand relations, notwithstanding the challenges that are there in doing so. I'll just say brief, briefly in response to your question, I think the point has been made, you use the word aid. I'd like to use the minister's word of opportunities and investments because aid is ne not necessarily long-term. You it might go towards some issue, but it's not sustainable, potentially. The banks are opportunities, creativity is needed. If I can give a creative step that was taken vis-a-vis -vis your country, and that is actually by legislation by our Congress and then by our Department of Treasury, it was called the Tropical Forest um, uh, Act. It basic debt swapped act. It alleviated Colombia's debt in return for Colombia taking action in supporting its tropical forests against coca growing. And actually, that was a great initiative. It was one that actually spawned some opportunities, economic opportunities, and also targeted a, 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 an ill in your country that tore the fabric of it too, meaning the growing of the coca crop in this case, and also the ruining of the, of the land. So I'm with the point about there are opportunities. We need to be more creative. It just, it hasn't, not enough has certainly been done in this regard. So it's not just giving aid. It's how to provide an environment that's conducive for good investment and for a foundation from which Latin American countries can really spring and grow from. Thank you for that. We are five minutes over, so no more questions. But Could I do I just like add to one point. No, no, no. One, one, second. Point. one, one, point. one point. Um, I actually do really like to end on a positive note. I think um, a lot of the conversation uh, this afternoon um, uh, was was rich in discussion, but unfortunately, kind of leaves us um, with a lot to to chew over and, and think about. But just a rapid fire response um, would be: What can we? What can we be hopeful about um, as we walk away from this discussion? And Minister, I will turn to you first. Um, hopefully that we're talking about it. I mean, this is, this is what we need to do. We need to talk about it. We need to have it front and center. There are opportunities. There is interest. And, uh, you know, the more that we engage in this, that we write about it, um, we can get hopefully more um, not on the, oh, Latin America problem, but Latin America, an opportunity. Thank you. Yeah, so rapid fire, uh, 
start looking at it as a region with opportunities. Brazil is a $1.6 trillion economy. Mexico is a trillion dollar economy, 11th, 9th largest economies in the world. Uh, there's major universities throughout Latin America that are increasingly world class health facilities, innovation on fintech, on other uh, uh, digital innovations for service markets. Uh, Latin America's response to the COVID pandemic, which impacted it worse than any. The recovery was on a scale and speed that no one predicted. That reflects uh, growing strength of institutions and leadership at multiple levels. Uh, and so uh, I do think there's a very positive environment to engage in, not the same the problems. And I'll just close one pitch uh, because we're at a university. We don't do people to people anymore in Latin America. Where is that 100,000 student scholarship for the region uh, to bring and create the synergies of the new generation of Latin Americans? 350,000 Chinese students study in the United States, much less than 100,000 Latin Americans uh, study in uh, the United States. 200,000 from India, 50,000 plus from uh, South Korea. I could go down the list. Uh, there's a tremendous opportunity to reach out to a new, dynamic, young generation that has a lot going for it in the region right now. So my comment will be very brief. I began with describing great power competition, uh, the United States, Russia, China. Russia, China are in and throughout Latin America. And uh, I think uh, uh, the positive or silver lining, hopefully there's a wake up call that if we're gonna compete, then we need to seize the opportunities and engage and act uh, and engage and collaborate in uh, uh, in Latin America. Thank you for that. I'd like to thank again my esteemed panelists. Uh, for